Welcome once again to the Spouter Inn. I'm Chris. And I'm Suzanne. And today, Chris and I are really happy to be joined by Sasan Tabatabai. He is a poet, translator, and scholar of medieval Persian literature. He's master lecturer in world languages and literatures and the core curriculum and coordinator of the Persian language program at Boston University. His translations of Persian poetry have appeared in many journals, and he's the author of Father of Persian Verse, Rudaki and His Poetry, Sufi Haiku, and Uzunburun Poems. He's also the translator of the novel we discussed last time, Blind Owl by Sadek Hadayat, published by Penguin Classics. His newest books, both of which are going to come out in spring 2023, are Ferry to Malta, Poems and Translations, and a Persian translation of the poetry of David Ferry. Welcome, Sasan. Thank you very much. Pleasure to be here. Thank you for joining us. I really enjoyed your translation of Blind Owl. It was both a delightful original, and it seemed, you know, I don't know the original, and I, I don't know the language it's coming from, but it, 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 it was a very compelling translation that seemed to capture uh, a lot of a lot of nuance. Uh, we, we should probably start by talking about how you first encountered Blind Owl. Um, my relationship with Blind Owl, I had read it a long time ago when I was a grad student, and then Recently, just a few years ago, we included it in a class I was teaching. So um, it's a class on tradition and modernity in Iranian film and literature. So where we we have films and then readings that, uh, for the most part, don't have anything to do with each other. But then that's up for the students to make the connections. Uh, so uh, the the translation that was out there... The, the typical translation that everyone read was by D.P. Costello. Um, and as I'm reading this and trying to teach it, I just realized that the, the voice of the narrator, for one thing, is completely wrong. And the students really were not getting what the original is all about through that translation. It was a weird intellectualized character uh, that didn't really mesh with um, uh, the voice of the narrator, you know, the crazy pen case painter in the original. So it was from a need to have a more accurate English translation. That's how it all started. So the classroom was really driving uh, your work on the translation. And I'm so struck by what you're saying about the narrator, because one of the things Chris and I were really struck by was the extent to which we have kind of more than one speaking persona as we read Blind Owl. There's that sort of nested narrative that goes back into the past, but also seems to be kind of a vision experience. And it must have been really challenging to navigate that in the translation process. Yes. For one thing, it, it's odd, you know, coming to this as a translator who uh, personally, I think, uh, you, you know, my first language is English. You know, even though my mother language is Persian, my first language is really English. I feel more comfortable in English. I've always written my own creative work in English. But reading the original, this sometimes happens in poetry too. As you're reading the original, you kind of hear it in your head yeah, in English. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and when that started to happen, I thought, all right, the, the, there's so many things that are just wrong with this character himself. You know, in the, the, the Costello translation, he was coming out sounding like an intellectual. You know, he was sounding like a character right out of Sappho or Camus. Um, whereas um, there is something so earthy and conversational about the way the narrator speaks throughout the work, uh, which I thought was lost. When that voice was becoming clear to you, were you, how can I put it, were you kind of hearing it through other works that Hadayat might have been interested in or known or that just echoed in your own mind from your teaching experience or your other reading. When Chris and I were reading, we, we there were many different sort of points of reference we kept coming up with, uh, books that kind of had not the same quality, but like similar flavors, I guess you could say. And the narrator's voice is a particularly idiosyncratic one, I thought. Suzanne, I'll tell you, after listening to your episode, I, I can't wait to read Poe's Bernice. <laughs> <laughs> and yeah, you really do hear echoes of other novelists. Uh, the one that really kind of struck me was as I was reading this, as I was translating it, was I heard so much of Dostoevsky's Raskolnikov in this character. It's odd with, with Russian literature. 
I love the the characters in Lush, Russian literature because they're the ones typically who suffer from brain fever. And then suddenly we have this guy, the, the unnamed pen case painter, who seems to be suffering from some kind of brain fever, the way the Dostoevsky's characters are. With Raskolnikov, it's the similarities were great because it's a character who lives for the most part inside his own head, but that is reflected in the in the room that he always uh, is locked up in. You know that becomes a kind of tomb for him. You know, so it's it's almost like a tomb within a tomb. He is locked up inside his own head and then locked up inside this room. Yeah, so the so the the, the, the Raskolnikov similarities really jumped out immediately. And it's got to be other points of connection, too, I'm thinking in, in Persian literature in particular, but also in traditions that might be less familiar to our listeners, like more generally. And I was thinking about that, especially with regard to this ideal of the feminine that we were really struck by reading the book and the way in which that sort of descends into a kind of materiality, even as it seems like it might lift you up, it just sort of descends again. And thinking about like uh, especially long narrative poetry uh, about love. And I wondered if in addition to seeing the sort of European modernism kinds of things that are happening in the background for Hadayat, are there other traditions that you feel are in the background there as well? Well, you know what's happening? And, and again, this really all came out after listening to you guys' episode on this, um, how you were talking about this, um, I don't know, the, the, the whole issue with modernity here. Right. And I think this is in a way that the female character ties into this, as does the creepy old man with the sinister laugh. So the scene he always paints, which is the old man wearing a turban, sitting under a cypress tree, little stream separating him from this beautiful woman in black offering him a water lily. Now, really, one of the ways we tend to read this book is is that it is, uh, in a way, a clash between tradition and modernity, right? And it is the, the, the modern instincts that are, in a way, driving this character mad. So if you look at the traditional Persian poetry, for example, again, we have like a thousand-year mm-hmm. poetic tradition. <laughs> <laughs> and you will always find different variations of this very same scene that he's painting right so there is always some kind of old man with a white beard and a turban possibly who represents the the wise dervish you know and uh, the 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 beautiful woman typically the sorry the wine bearer is very often offering the old wise man, a glass of wine. Now, that concept really gets turned on its head in Blind Out. Suddenly, um, nothing is as uh, wonderfully idealistic as what we learn in the classics. So the the wise old man who is supposed to be, you know, um, a mystic who has some kind of insight into some kind of spiritual truth, becomes really, as you said, uh, it's both him and the woman, right? There is this materiality that that infiltrates both of them. And they become really the the, the polar opposites of what they represent from a classical perspective. It makes me think back, too, to uh, Atar's Conference of the Birds, the Sheikh Saman episode, and the ways in which this love he develops for the Christian woman that seems to lead him down this terrible path away from rightly directed religious veneration ends up, bizarrely enough, to be a sort of roundabout way of bringing him back, not toward filth, but back toward the sacred center and toward this kind of like redemptive experience. And this is, you know, I don't want to push too hard on the juxtaposition of those texts, but I feel like the way in which love and wholeness and transcendence is kind of at the center of probably Sufi poetry more broadly, but I'm thinking of Atar in particular right now. And in Blind Owl, this is that that path is just not there. Oh, absolutely. See, and with the um, the, the Sheikh Salman story, the, the humiliation he has to go through is in a way to get beyond uh, his attachments to the material world. Exactly. Right. Exactly. And yes. So it, it's 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 his pride 
as being the, the, the most revered sheikh in Mecca with, with hundreds of followers. So it's that, in a way, that his attachment to the material world, whether it's, you know, whether, whether it's pride, whether it's, um, I don't know, arrogance, whatever it may be, that's what he has to get over. And then with Hedoyat, with Blind Al, I, I think this is what, what you were saying a little earlier. It's what we see is everything kind of deteriorating into materialism. It, it becomes just, in a way, the, the, the perverted uh, opposite aspect of all the wonderful things we read in the Sufi poems. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. I'm, I'm curious, you mentioned teaching this in a Persian graduate course uh, as part of the you know, moments of encounter that made you decide you needed to give a better translation of it. And I'm wondering about the original language of it, what kind of register it's in, whether it is in a, like a higher, more literary register, in a lower one, and if that kind of perversion of traditions, uh, or sort of bringing it down to earth anyways, uh, is present in the language. Is it is it playing with traditional poetries in the language the way that it's doing it with the imagery? Well, the language itself is relatively straightforward, and it's very conversational. The register is very colloquial, right? So it's that there is nothing really formal about what he is saying. We get the sense that the character is actually quite provincial. You know, that there there really isn't much intellectual activity going on with him, right? It seems to be a lot of soul-searching. You know, and trying to tap into the, the real dark recesses of his own psyche. But the language itself is is relatively straightforward and conversational. I was just going to say that word, the conversational quality. It's almost like he's confiding in us or telling us his, you know, his private story in this intimate kind of way. Oh, absolutely. And then the, the way that it, it unfolds is sometimes you get these sentences that the sentence has gone on for almost an entire page. Yeah. You know, that the entire <laughs> paragraph might be one sentence, uh-huh. you uh-huh. know, um, and which leaves the reader slightly breathless if you're trying to kind of keep up with the prose. Are there parts of the text that you're especially proud of, either either that you're very proud of the translation you accomplished, or parts of the text that you particularly love that really stay in your mind, even after having taught this and lived with it for such a long period of time? You know, that that opening paragraph itself is, 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 is very interesting, mm-hmm. right? Um, and if I can maybe just read a little bit of it. Please do. First of all, it's one of the most famous opening sentences out of any Persian novel. That zendegi zahoi has ke mesle khore in life, there are wounds that, like termites, slowly bore into and eat away at the isolated soul. So, yeah, that there's something right from the opening sentence. You get this sense of this character is somehow possessed, right? It's possessed by another creature that is inside it, kind of driving him to do things. And yet alone, right? He uses the word isolated, right? You know, and this sense of being cut off from everyone else. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. And then talking about, I don't know, uh, one of my favorite sentences, it really comes up right at the end of that first paragraph and, you know, isolated. So you can't tell anyone about these pains. People think of them as strange and unnatural. And if you try to talk or write about them, they fall back on their same worn beliefs and dismiss them with a mocking smile. That's because man has not yet found any solution, any drug that can cure them. The only cure can be found in the amnesia brought on by wine and the artificial sleep of opium. But alas, these remedies are short-lived, and instead of relief, after a short time, they only add to the pain. And this is is one of my favorite sentences coming up. Um, One day will someone be able to discover the secret to these supernatural events when the shadow of the soul languishes in the purgatory between sleep and wakefulness. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, so there, there were some sentences, uh, obviously, you know, lend themselves very nicely to be translated, you know, and um, the, the whole mention of purgatory. Mm-hmm. I was just going to ask about that. Yeah. What, what's the word for that in Farsi? Barzakh. Huh. 
So it says, آیا روزی به اصرار این اتفاقات ماورای طبیعی supernatural این انعکاس سایه روح that is the reflection of the shadow of the soul mm. در حالت اغما اغما being something like unconsciousness و برزخ برزخ the purgatory the, 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 um, the area between in a way um, بین خواب و بیداری between sleep and being awake جلوه می کند کسی پی خواهد بود Will anyone be able to distinguish that? Mm, mm. And it's weird because in Persian um, the way the syntax works is the, the verb usually comes up at the end, of the end of the sentence you know, so kind of the opposite of English you know, in, in English there's no ambiguity as to what's going to happen you, you know, you, the verb, the action is there and then you kind of kick the sentence in front of you uh, so you know exactly where you're going Uh, with Persian, you have to wait until the very last word. And it all gets knitted together then. Yeah, yeah exactly. You know, it's all the different pieces are there except for the action. Um, so you got to wait for that until the very end. Mm. And the fact that it's a question, you know, it really just pulls the reader in into this kind of weird intimacy with the narrator almost at the very beginning. Yes, yes. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. Well, and it also encourages you to think right away that there is potentially some sort of key to the mysteries of the novel, right? Yeah. That this is going to be a supernatural style story, which it opens up with some of the more supernatural sounding events with the, you know, the mysterious woman showing up dead in the room that you don't have any explanation for at that point. And then it's like, well, is this solvable? And it, it gives the reader a goal, but there is no solution so to speak like that that is just a way of getting you in and then and then sort of shifting the goalposts away from you as a reader uh which i think is is really lovely hmm. is that puzzle that puzzle like quality we were talking about before i think maybe right it's set up like a kind of puzzle i think and then it becomes a different kind of mystery by the end of the book and that's um typically how we like to read it in class um read it almost as a puzzle so you you have that very odd and just enigmatic first part that is so hallucinatory in a way if you read that by itself you just have absolutely no idea what's happening and then once you read the second part then it starts to unlock some of the mysteries that we find in the first part you know like uh, where the where did that poison wine come from who is this character like you know the, the the constantly repeating kind of you know archetype of that weird sinister old man you know with the laugh that makes the hair of your body stand on end but it also gives us new not mysteries exactly but new unexplained ends so for example the story about the narrator's life gives us the story of his father and his uncle the twins and so on but it also tells us about his mother who we were struck by as the only named character who inhabits this very different kind of i don't know what to call it sort of symbolic space you know as a dancer in the temple um, and then also the figure of the blind owl is something that emerges only very late in the narrative and it feels like a puzzle you could solve but i don't know our chris and i are both saying how we felt like we were kind of bumping up against the limits of our ability to interpret in those moments yeah um again i was fascinated by listening to to to, to your episode uh, a little earlier and um you bring up some Uh, very good points um one thing okay so with the owl for example you know why is it called blind owl uh, and you're absolutely right that the first time okay he's been in conversation with his shadow throughout from the very beginning that's who he wants to write for that's who he wants to confess to in a way it's for posterity he doesn't care but it's it's that image of the owl And then when we meet the owl at the very end, so what he says is, you know, that the room that's like a grave and got darker and more cramped by the second uh, night surrounded me with its gruesome shadows. I sat in front of a smoldering tallow burning lamp wrapped in a fur-lined coat, a cloak and a scarf, and my shadow rested on the wall. My shadow on the wall was more vibrant, more defined, more real than my true self. Apparently the old oddman's guy 
the butcher, Nana June, my slut wife, had all been my shadows at some point, shadows among whom I was in prison. At that moment, I looked like an owl, but my cries were knotted in my throat, and I spat them out like bloody phlegm. Right? Maybe the owl also had an ailment that made him think like me. Right? My shadow on the wall looked just like an owl, bent over and reading all my writings closely. Now, it, it's interesting because the, the owl that he describes here um, is, okay, he says blind owl. But if the, the, the owl has, um, its cries are knotted in its throat, so that, that kind of makes, makes it a mute owl as well. Um, now, the owl, as you guys had mentioned before, in, in Persian literature, um, is, is an omen, is a bad omen, right? It's, 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 it brings bad news. It, it usually ushers in something negative that's about to happen. Uh, but the owl, going to back to Conference of the Birds for a second, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Um, if you guys remember the owl, um, the owl is the bird that resides over uh, ruins, right? So it's associated with ruin and with decay. Yeah, yeah. Um, you know, he sits there guarding the things that other people have discarded. And yeah, the, his whole um, conversation with his shadows is fascinating because he he describes his shadow in in a number of different ways right the shadow that is more vibrant than him right and there's a part when he's in the bathhouse and he's looking at his own shadow on the bathhouse wall a few nights ago as i was undressing in the alcove of the bathhouse my mindset changed as the bath clerk poured water over my head, I felt my black thoughts being washed away. In the bath stall, I saw my own shadow on the perspiring wall. I saw that I was just as scrawny and frail as 10 years ago when I was a kid. I totally remember that is how the shadow of my body would fall on the perspiring wall of the bath stall. I looked at my body closely. There was a hopeless sensuality about my thighs, calves, and genitals. They had the same shadows that they did 10 years ago, the same shadows as when I was a kid. I felt my life, aimless and meaningless, had passed like a vagrant shadow that quivers on the bathhouse wall. Um, so the, this, the, the, the constant you know, conversation he's having uh, with his shadow is fascinating. It makes me think back to to, uh, Mary Shelley's Frankenstein, you know, where the creator and his creation have this kind of double relationship one to the other, you know, the ways in which this is a kind of a second self. And when you were reading that passage at the end of the novel where we, you know, we hear the description of the shadow as an owl, you know, at that moment I looked like an owl. I'm so struck by the way in which it's a kind of, I don't know what to call it, like a closed circle of the narrator and his shadow because the um he says the shadow my shadow on the wall looked just like an owl bent over and reading all my writings closely so my writings are the things that i'm writing and simultaneously my shadow was reading my writings right it's like this closed loop almost of of isolation and yet kind of bitter companionship oh yes yes and it's it's very odd because you know, he mentions it in, in different places. Um, is, is the shadow an emanation of him? Or does he see himself as an emanation mm-hmm. of the shadow? Mm-hmm. Right? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And it's, mm-hmm. um, it's the shadow. We, we start with the shadow. But increasingly, as we go through the story, um, the mirror also starts to figure into the story. Right? He keeps looking in the mirror. Right, he when he looks in the mirror, and he looks like he says the red meat that hangs outside the butcher shop. Mm-hmm. You know, mm-hmm. so he's already starting to identify with the, the slaughtered animal, but then he also identifies with the butcher. He identifies with both the the, the slaughtered and the slaughterer. So yes, very, very odd stuff going on in this book. 
But I'm struck too that by the ways in which the kind of points of reference you're pulling out here, like the way the shadow and then also the reflection in the mirror work as kind of additional manifestations of the self. Like this is a novel we've been talking about in terms of modernism, and that is totally part of what's going on. But there's this, um, how can I put it? I think that you're, you know, I know your own research is centered in earlier periods of literature. You know, you're not primarily working um, in, in modernism for your own research field, right? That's where you teach. But this this awareness of this deeper literary context and the sort of philosophical and theological commitments that go to it, I feel like those inform your reading and therefore your translation in a really like vibrant way. Yeah, it's 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 amazing. Some of this stuff, some of the Persian literature that it, it gets under your skin and that's it. You're <laughs> stuck with it for the rest of your life. Well like um, we were talking about Atar, right? Like so for example, uh the owl here is functioning as a figure for the writer and we can, you know, put that in conversation with other traditions of the writer or the poet or the singer as someone who is bird-like, you know, but the comparisons are going to be to the nightingale or to these these beautiful creatures that produce song, right, as opposed to the owl, which produces only bad omen, right? Oh, certainly, which is kind of goes back to that image he keeps painting on the pen cases. You know, that is a typically, that is a beautiful image. You know, pick up any edition of, I don't know, Omar Khayyam's Rubaiyat. Chances are it's going to be a variation of that image on it. For sure. And, you know, talking about this this connection to, to more classical works, um, something else that struck me that you guys picked up on um, in, in the episode is uh, the, the, the function of repetitions. Um, you were saying how very accurately like in the in the classical narrative poetry you know there's these formulaic repetitions that come up right and and then we have these very weird formulaic repetitions that come up in blind owl um and i think the function is completely the opposite in the in the classical works and in this modern work so Again, if we're dealing with, I don't know, especially things that might have roots in the oral tradition, though those the repetitions that come up in the longer works of narrative poetry, um, they keep the reader kind of grounded. It's, it's that same familiar signpost that keeps you on the right track. Um, when we get to Blind Owl, when we get these very odd repetitions, with you know the, the the so many characters, the old men have the sinister laugh that makes the hair of your body stand on end, mm-hmm. and the objects that reappear and so on. Oh, the objects, even the way he describes things, right at the very beginning when he meets the grave digger and the grave digger's horses. You know, it's um, his description. They took long, gentle strides. Their thin legs trod the ground gingerly, soundlessly, like thieves who, according to the law, have had their fingers amputated and the stumps dunked in hot oil. In the second part, it's almost a verbatim repetition when he's watching the, um, the, the horses that draw the little wagon that bring the sheep to the butcher. So the function of repetition in Blind Owl It's a completely opposite uh, way it functions in that it unhinges the reader, Mm -hmm, right? mm -hmm. It makes you feel like you're in some weird dream and you can't get up. Well, yeah, that's exactly it. That's exactly it. Like, because the first sensation you have is of recognition and the aha, you know, like you've solved something and then you're immediately confused. You're immediately nonplussed. That's right. Um, And it's like you said, like a dream where you are disoriented by this thing, this repetition. That's right. And Suzanne, I loved it. You, you, you described it all uh, as a, it's like a glitch in the matrix, right? It's like, oh, there it is. It's another glitch in the matrix. It's like, I have seen this before. <laughs> Now, you know, you were talking about repetition in, in poetry as a way of thinking about this technique that Hadayat is adapting and, and reworking and doing something very different with. And, and I know you've done a lot of other translation. Most or all of your other translation work has been poetry. Is this your only prose translation? or This has been my only prose translation. Oh, that must have been a very different experience. Yes, it, it was different. And boy, it was, uh, in a way, it was such a relief. I'm like, oh my God, you know, <laughs> um, <laughs> translating poetry is, you know, is like going for a swim 
in really in a really rough ocean, you know. And then you're translating prose is like, oh, this is great. This is like you know swimming in a lake. <laughs> so it's there's so many different considerations. Yeah, typically it's it's poetry um, because myself, my own creative writing uh, has been poetry. I think maybe I published one short story in all these years. That's it. Um, the rest has all been poetry. So yes, translating poetry is a completely different animal. Chris, do you have experience with translating poetry? I know you you will write, but I don't know if you've translated as well. Uh, I've done a bit. I've mostly not been very satisfied with it. I've had the most fun and the most interesting results when I've pushed that dissatisfaction really hard. Um, I don't want to. I don't want to make this all about me and my work. So to speak. no, but I was just really curious because I mean. I guess, like I, I, I've I've done quite a bit of translation one way or the other, just a, as a part of like research stuff, and it's just very different when you have the feeling you've got it just right. And by that, I don't mean necessarily word for word translation, but where you've really captured the sense of something, and in particular when you've captured something of the orality of it, of the of the flow, of the feel of it, like not just meaning, but there's something more that's come across as well. And even in translating prose, not just poetry, I've had that kind of feeling at times, and I'm not someone who has as much experience as either one of you, so I'm really curious to to get a sense of that, what that's like. Well, you said just now, you you know, when you've captured the sense of it. And I think one of the things with poetry in particular is that you have to choose which of the senses of it you're going to go for or prioritize or maybe you can even get two but uh, you know a good poem offers you many many different senses to go through and translation is all about in my sense of it anyways is all about juggling which of those senses you're you're choosing and sometimes there's an expectation of which of those senses you're going to pick but you know you can make other choices sometimes and and, and that can be fun you know whether uh, surface meaning or whether formal structure or whether resonance to other texts that the piece is alluding to or whether it's sort of the function of that piece in the world yeah you know, picking any of those as the sense you're trying to get across could lead you to a very different translation um with translation it's 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 funny because in a way it's a, especially poetry, it's a doomed endeavor from the beginning. Um, yeah. <laughs> and, uh, but that is exactly why we translate. We translate because it is a doomed endeavor. There's no way around it. And Suzanne, you were talking about, um, and Chris, you were talking about judging translations. Uh, I've had an experience recently. I, I, I've typically translated Persian to English. Yeah, and you've just done the opposite, right? I was so excited by that. Yeah, I've been doing the opposite. Um, I've been translating David Ferry's poems. And uh, David Ferry, I don't know if you're familiar with his work, but, um, you know, I, I think he's really one of the greatest living American poets um, today. Um, he's 98 years old. Wow. I didn't even know he was still living. That's amazing. Oh, yes. Um, so translating his poetry, um, it, it all started, um, again, you brought up the translation of Gilgamesh. That's the one we typically taught. It was David Ferry's translation. So I had met him at BU and then met him at different poetry readings. And then after a while, we became friends. And we would have lunch together at this place uh, where, you know, near where we both lived. And um, I started translating one of his poems just to see how it would work. And then after that, COVID happened. So we couldn't meet in person anymore. And then we had phone conversations all the time. And what I wanted to do was uh, really have something to talk to him on the phone so that I wouldn't be just, you know, small talk. <laughs> and um, so I started translating his poetry into Persian. And, you know, going back to what you guys were saying about how do you judge something, um, in particular a poem. You know, are we judging it as as a work of scholarship? Are we judging it as you know? Uh, are we judging the the, the euphony of the lines? The, what works about it? Um, what was fascinating with my experience with David is that he he obviously doesn't understand any Persian at all, but his he has such an incredible ear, and he would ask me about things, and then when we would read together, you know, sometimes stanza by stanza. And if the sounds of the poetry mapped onto the sounds of his English lines, 
then that seemed to be something that's working. Mm. Yeah. 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 That, yeah. Well, that's what I meant about the orality, you know, that the feel or the something that's other than meaning has come over. Um, what an amazing experience that must have been. Yes, yeah. So I actually I talked to him earlier today. <laughs> <laughs> now, prose doesn't necessarily offer as many difficulties as poetry might in terms of the number of things you might be trying to capture. But were there any parts of Blind Owl that you found very difficult to translate? Some parts, you know what parts were a little difficult? The parts that he is obviously, ha the character is obviously having some kind of hallucinations, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. The hallucinatory mm -hmm. parts were, were a little difficult. Because they were confusing and trying to figure out what was going on or? Yeah, yeah. Because, because they're confusing. Exactly. I mean, it's um, just the, the, the Persian original is confusing. You know, you're reading it and it's like, okay, I, I, I hope I'm getting this right. And, and he's obviously, Hedayat is obviously doing a lot of that on purpose. You know, he wants to draw you in into the psyche of the narrator. So you share his confusion, right? You share his disorientation. Yeah, exactly. And the, 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 key, the, the key word is disorientation. Absolutely. Well, we could talk with you and about Blind Owl and other texts for hours and hours and hours. I feel like we've only begun unpacking this further and exploring these things further. But time is running short, so I think we're going to have to wrap it there. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you very much for having me. It's been such a good conversation. I've learned so much and really enjoyed it. Thank you both so much. Well, listeners, if you'd like to get in touch with us, you can email us at spouter at megaphonic.fm or we're on Twitter at The Spouter. We'd love to hear from you. Show notes with links for things that we've mentioned in this episode will be at megaphonic.fm slash spouter slash 64B. And the Spouter Inn is one of the fancy little podcasts over at Megaphonic FM. So until next time. Until next time. See you again at the Spouter Inn.